Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer, and this is Superhouse. Now, I get questions all the time about the cameras that I use. There are often comments on my YouTube videos about what do I do with the closed circuit TV cameras? Uh, where does the video go? Do I store it? All of that sort of thing. So today I'm going to do an episode that is entirely software. I'm going to show you how to take images off one of these cameras and store it. Let's have a look at how it's done. One of the cool things about these particular cameras is they support uploading to an FTP server. Down here you can see a little configuration icon. So we'll click on that and then select FTP service settings. So from here you can configure an FTP server hostname username, password, and a folder or directory as the destination. And the camera can upload snapshots periodically to that FTP server. If you have an FTP server available to you, that's fantastic, that's all you need to do. Put the settings in here and away you go. However, it can be really useful to run your own FTP server um, on your local network because you can do all sorts of interesting things. So I'm gonna show you how to do that now. Now one of the things that can be really useful to have on your network, even if you're a Macintosh user or a Windows user, is a Linux machine because you can use it for general purpose utilities. Now what I'm going to do is SSH from my Mac to a, an Ubuntu Linux machine which is on the network. It happens to be my old laptop and I'm going to use it as a guinea pig to show you what I'm going to do. So the first thing we're going to do is install an FTP server so that the camera can do an upload. So, we'll do sudo apt-get install proftpd, uh, proftpd basic. So this is an FTP server, just with some simple configuration options. There are other proftp um, varieties and there are other FTP servers. This just happens to be an easy one to get going. So proftp should be installed, there it goes. And we can test it. So I'll just check whether FTP is running. Yep, ProFTP is running. So from my Mac in this other terminal window, I'm going to try to connect. This is just testing that the FTP server is running. So I'm going to log in as myself and the password for my machine. And there we go, I'm logged into the remote machine. But there is one thing to be careful of. And that is that a lot of FTP servers don't bind users to their root direct or to their home directory. So if I go CD slash, for example, I can now see the whole file system of this machine. And that's bad. So what we can do is change the configuration in the FTP server to disallow that. Now you just saw that I jumped into the root directory of the machine and then I've exited back out of it again. So let's go back over to the server that we are configuring. And what we'll do is have a look in the FTP uh, configuration. In ProFTP, it has an option here called default root. And this specifies a location in which to jail users. It's normally commented out, and um, I think this is a mistake. It should actually be active by default. That's the way I would prefer to have this set up. And the little tilde symbol just means home directory. So by turning this option on, we're jailing the users into their home directory. They can't get anywhere else. So we'll write that file out and I'll restart the ProFTP uh, server. I'll restart rather. Okay, so the FTP server is now restarted. And let's try this again. We'll FTP back into that machine and I'm logging in as myself. I can see the files in my home directory. What happens if I do cd slash? It's still just the files in my home directory. That's perfect. That means that users can't see anything outside of their home directory. And um, you might think that that doesn't matter because if it's a, the machine's only exposed on your own local network, who else is going to get in? If you trust users, that's fine. I don't like that general philosophy, I prefer to practice a, um, a security in-depth approach. I don't trust any machines on my local network. So 
if um, someone comes in and plugs in a device that I'm not aware of, um, it, I don't want them to have access to everything on the network. A lot of people take the attitude that everything behind the firewall is safe, but that's not really a very good um, approach to network security. So, what we'll do now is go back over to the remote machine. So we've now got the FTP server running and we've got users jailed. But what we're gonna do is add a user just for camera 41, which is this camera in the office. So I'm going to add a user there and I'll set a password for it. And that's because I want the cameras to log in as totally different users and have them jailed into a location that no other user can get to. That keeps everything compartmentalized and it means that the cameras don't have any particular privileges that allow them to do anything else. So even if someone gets in past those credentials, they won't be able to get anywhere else on the machine. So we now have a user called camera41 created. The FTP server is running and we've tested that users are jailed within the FTP server. So let's go over here. FTP server, we'll put in the address. We've just seen that's 192.168.1.158. It's the address of my laptop. The user I just created is camera41 and I'll put in the password. Now, actually what I'll do is I'll make a new directory and I'll call it uploads. So back over here, um, I'll do sudo su camera41. So I am now camera41 into that home directory and I'll make a directory called uploads. So that is where we want the camera to put its images. And in fact, if we go into that and have a look, you'll see that it's empty. So back in the configuration for the camera, we're gonna set the uploads folder as uploads. Now something that'll catch you here is that if you just do test, it won't work. This catches me every time. It says, please set at first and then test. Um, what that's trying to tell you is that you have to actually save the settings by hitting submit and then you can test. So if we now click the test button, it will attempt to use these credentials to log into the FTP server. So I'll click that, it opens a new tab and we'll see what happens. Yes, success. So we can close that tab and now the camera can connect to the FTP server. In fact, if we switch back to the FTP server and have a look, there is a test image that's been added there. Now I'll just remove that image so that we've got an empty directory again. We now have this configured to be able to upload. So I'll turn on upload image now and I'll say upload interval in seconds, one second and I'll save it. So our camera is now configured to upload by FTP a snapshot at one second intervals. So we are back on our FTP server. We'll have a look and you can see there are a couple of images in there. And if we keep watching, now it's obviously not actually at one second intervals here because there is some delay during the upload, but it's attempting to upload basically at one second intervals. And you'll see that the list of images there just keeps growing. Each of those images is a snapshot of, the, of what the camera is seeing. So I'm just going to slide myself back again, wave at the camera. And now let's get some of those images over to the local machine and, um, and see what's going on. So I'm just going to make a new folder here and I'll call it camera 41. And let's go into it and there's nothing in it. And then go back to the terminal, which is on the local machine. So I'll change into camera 41. So I'm on the command line on my Mac in this empty folder. So what I can do now is SCP um, from, I'll log into the remote machine, camera 41, 192.168.1.158. And from the uploads directory, 
I want to grab everything, all the JPEGs, and I want to copy them locally. So that's now copied over some images. We'll switch back to <clears throat> the directory on the local Mac, and there we go, we've got some pictures. So we can open these up, and that is a snapshot taken from the camera. So we have snapshots that are at a little bit more than one second intervals. So that's pretty cool. Now that may be all you want to do. At this point, you have the camera uploading snapshots to a directory, which could be a remote FTP server, could be an FTP server on your local directory. And one thing that you could do, which I've actually done in the past, is had that target directory within a Dropbox folder so that all of those images get sent off site. So back over here on our FTP server, we have a look at a list of files that have been uploaded. And as you can see, the timestamp is included in the file name. You can see it's got 2013 and then 09 because it's September and the 21st and then it's got the timestamp. So that can be really helpful. Later on, if you're looking at that image, you know exactly when it was taken. What I'm going to do now though, is take all of these images and convert them into a time-lapse movie. And that means that we're going to lose that information. What's really helpful is to be able to look at a particular frame of the video and know exactly the point in time at which that was taken. Now, one way I like to do this is to take that information and embed it as a watermark, so text directly into the image itself. Then when we convert it to a movie, you can just read the value off the bottom of the frame and you know when it was taken. That can be done using a little script um, that comes as part of the ImageMagick package. ImageMagick is normally installed on most Linux distros. You can just install it if it's not already. And so what I'm going to do is make a directory called video. And this is just to keep the images separate. And I'm going to CP, which is copy, all of the images into this directory. So this is basically taking a snapshot. So now in the video directory, we have all of these images. The reason I'm doing that is that I'm going to manipulate these files now and I don't want to manipulate the original source files that have been uploaded by the camera. So what we can do now is execute uh, the convert command on each of these images in turn. <clears throat> now that will take a while if you do it manually, but we can do it in a for loop. This is one of the things that makes command line operations so powerful. What I can do is say for name in star.jpg. So what we're doing here is doing a for loop and we're creating a variable called name and the value of that variable is going to be set to the name of each of the files in turn. And then on each of those file names, we can do something. So I'm going to do convert, and that's the command from uh, ImageMagick, convert name. So this is the file we're going to operate on. Then I'm going to set some variables, or some options. So I'm going to set font to courier, because I know I've got that installed. And I'll set the point size to 20. Now I'm going to write some text directly onto the image now, onto each of these images in turn. So we'll do draw, and then we have to do some options. So we'll set gravity south, that means that the text will tend to be on the bottom of the image. And we'll set the, um, the fill color to black, and then we'll put the text at location 012. Now because the gravity is set to south, um, that means that 0 is going to be centered on the bottom and then 12 is going to be 12 up from the bottom. So this is like a subtitle. The actual value that we want to put there is just the file name. Now we could just leave it at that, but the problem is that black text on the image may not be always legible. So what I'm going to do is write it in twice. So we'll do this time fill white and we'll do text and we'll offset it by one pixel um, in both the X and Y. And then we'll do name again. So what we're doing here is writing first in black and then offsetting a little and writing it in white. And that'll make the text more distinct, easier to read. 
So then we want to uh, write this out to a file call with the same name. You could write it out to a different file name if you wanted to, but I'm just going to write, overwrite the original source file. I don't care about keeping the original. And then just so we can see what's going on, we'll echo the file name and done. So that's the end of the for loop. So that little command is going to process each of those images and stick the name of the file in the image itself. Let's give it a try, see if I made any syntax errors. Doesn't look like it. It's processing the files. And I'll jump back over to the other terminal here. And in a moment, as soon as it's finished, yes, it's finished. We will copy these files. Oh no, I don't want the uploads directory. Now I want all of the, uh, the JPEGs in the video directory. So I'll copy those back to my local machine just so I can see them. Now we'll flip back into um, Finder. Let's have a look at one of these images. We'll open it up and look at that. You can see that down the bottom of the image, it's got the file name inside the image itself. That is perfect. Now that we have our images all nicely timestamped, let's jump back to the Linux machine. So we're back in the directory where we have all of these nice timestamped images Let's turn them into a video. Now the way we do this is using a program called MEncoder. Now there are other things you can use as well. Um, I've done this using different tools in the past, but MEncoder is a nice easy one to use. So what we do is we tell it we've got a multi-file input and we're going to say that we want all of the .jpg files in this directory. And we tell it multi-file. So we need to give it some options. All of these images are being recorded at 64480, so let's make the, um, the output video the same, 64480. And we'll make it, uh, so frames per second, uh, make it equal 25. And we've got to tell it that the input type is all JPEGs as well. So this tells MEncoder what to do with all of the source files we're giving it. Now we need to specify an output video codec. I'm going to specify LAVC, which means um, libav codec and this way we're going to get an avi file at the other end now we'll give it some um, libav uh, codec options as well and we've got to set the video codec and we'll make it mpeg4 and set a couple of other options so mbd equals 2 and trel now we've also got to set the output audio codec now there's no audio in these JPEGs, so we'll just say copy, and that basically just says um, blindly pass through whatever there is, which of course will be nothing. And we'll set the output file to, for now let's just call it output.avi. Now let's see if I've got the syntax of this correct. It seems to be working. So what this is doing now is chomping over each of those individual JPEGs, and it's now just built a file if we have a look at what's in here, we can see there's an output.avi file. It's currently 1.1 meg, and that is a video that's been made of all of those frames. So let's come back over here, and we will copy output.avi to my local machine. And that way we can see the end result. Now I'll just jump back across to on the Mac to the bottom. Here we go and this is the AVI file. I'll open that with VLC because I know that can play it. And here we go, look, we're seeing all the timestamps flickering past, and this is a time-lapse video now. Oh, you can see me walking around the room at 25 frames per second. So basically it's going to be at 25 times real time. There, all done. So what we have now are images being saved off the camera. They're being put on an FTP server, timestamped within the image itself and converted to a time-lapse movie. You can keep that on the FTP server, you can stick it on Dropbox. <clears throat> Basically now you've got everything you need to be able to save the, um, the footage coming off your camera. So I hope you found that useful. See you next time.